Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientists monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Connor Liston will present Finding and Fixing Broken Brain Circuits in Depression. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is committed to alleviating the suffering caused by mental illness by awarding grants that will lead to advances and breakthroughs in scientific research. The foundation is the largest private funder of mental health research grants. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $379 million to fund more than 5,500 grants to over 4,000 scientists around the world. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists who are working to find breakthroughs in disorders such as addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, OCD, PTSD, and schizophrenia. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Connor Liston. Dr. Liston is Assistant Professor of Neuroscience and Psychiatry at the Real Cornell Medical College Feel Family Brain and Mind Institute. Dr. Liston is also a 2013 recipient of a Foundation Young Investigator Grant and an Honorable Mention recipient of the 2016 Clearman Friedman Prize for Exceptional Clinical Research. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Liston's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Following the presentation, I will ask as many questions as time permits. And now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Connor Liston. Connor, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Jeff, for uh, inviting me here. I'm really thrilled to be here. Just getting my slides started. Um, so I am, as you as you mentioned, I'm a neuroscientist and a psychiatrist here at Weill Cornell Medicine, and um, I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, one of the projects underway in my lab that was made possible through support from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. It's really just getting started, um, but we're very excited about the initial results, um, and I hope they'll be of interest to some of our listeners today. Uh, so these statistics. Uh, will be familiar to psychiatrists, but I think to a lot of other folks, they're a little surprising. Um, so by some estimates, uh, psychiatric disorders um, and depression in particular account for five of the top ten leading causes of disability. They're, they're extremely disabling disorders, um, and they're extremely costly, too. We invest a lot of money in the United States in, in treating um, mental illness, um, and and there's a lot of money lost due to the disability um, from, from people who suffer from mental illnesses. And by, by one measure, uh, depression is actually the leading cause of disability. Um, and, and part of the reason for why this is, is that many of these disorders, depression, substance abuse, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, they tend to emerge early in life. And although we have good treatments, uh, there's no cure. And so there's this gradually emerging um, burden of the illness that's, that occurs over the course of a person's life. Um, and one of the big challenges in treating um, these kinds of mental illness is that it can be difficult. Um, any, any patients or family members who are listening right now will, will be able probably to resonate with this message. It, it's often difficult to find the right treatment for the right person. Um, and I think it's not controversial to say that part of why it's so challenging to match individual treatments, um, which, which often do work well when we find the right match, um, but it's challenging to match individual treatments to individual patients, partly because of how we diagnose mental illness today. Um, so this, uh, the Diagnostic uh, and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM, um, this uh, book which we use for um, diagnosing mental illness has been really influential and it's done a lot of good for people. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a thing that um, has kind of seeped into the, um, the public lexicon. Lots of people are familiar with it. Um, and it was designed uh, um, 
to to accomplish another a number of goals, and one of them was to provide a language for psychiatrists and other mental health care providers to communicate with each other um, about the problems that their patients are suffering from. And one of the goals that they wanted to accomplish in doing that um, was to come up with diagnostic labels that we could all agree on so that when one psychiatrist or one therapist saw a patient sitting in his office, um, he would uh, generally um, agree with the diagnosis um, given by another psychiatrist or therapist who, who saw that patient recently. Um, and one of the ways we we accomplished that goal was by um, was by creating large categories that tend to um, combine patients with many different problems under a single diagnostic label. And uh, depression is a great example of that. Um, depression is diagnosed today, a major depressive episode that is, is diagnosed today when a person suffers from five or more of these nine symptoms. And that means that there's at least 256 unique combinations, unique ways that a person can meet these criteria. And that's not even accounting for the fact that some of these criteria are, are kind of um, opposites um, of, of one another, like uh, weight loss or weight gain, insomnia or hypersomnia. Um, and I, I think a lot of uh, psychiatrists, um, and neuroscientists um, would agree that it's likely that someone who's suffering from weight loss, no appetite, only able to sleep four or five hours a night, very agitated, very anxious, um, is probably not suffering from exactly the same biological problem as someone who has gained a lot of weight because they have an increased appetite, they're craving carbohydrates all the time, they're sleeping 19 hours a day, can't get out of bed, um, and they feel um, slowed and lethargic and um, can barely move. Um, they have no problems with anxiety, but they're but they but they just have no interest in things that used to in, uh, that used to they used to enjoy. Um, and um, those those two people sound almost like opposites of one another, and yet um, we give them the same diagnostic label today. Um, and before I go on to tell you about um, how we're trying to rethink this approach, I always like to emphasize that I think that the DSM has done a lot of good for people. Um, it's been really critical in ensuring that, that, uh, that patients have access to mental health care resources. And like I said before, providing a language um, for, for communicating about mental illness. But it was never designed... Uh, to be a tool for neuroscience research. Um, and, and I think a lot of scientists today um, think that, uh, that it, it's, it's um, not very useful for, for um, studying the neurobiology of mental illness in, in a number of ways. And, um, and, and, and part of that has to do with the fact that there's this big heterogeneity, um, diversity in the, in the kinds of patients who, who, who get these diagnostic labels and there's no one-to-one -one correspondence with their kind of underlying biology. So how do we go about rethinking that? Um, well, um, we're certainly not the first people to tackle this problem. There's been a lot of interest in thinking about how to subtype depression for for many years. Um, and this work has also been really influential. Um, and the way it's typically been done is we've um, looked at big groups of patients and we've asked um, what kinds of clinical symptoms tend to co-occur in subsets of those patients. And based on those patterns, um, we've discovered uh, subtypes of depression um, and, and, and we've learned a lot from, from defining these subtypes. Again, some of them, like seasonal depression, um, is a term that lots of people are familiar with. It's seeped into the public lexicon. We, we, uh, many people know what seasonal depression is. Um, but uh, the fact remains that there's still, um, with rare exceptions, um, very few uh, biomarkers, objective measures that we can, that we can obtain from patients either in, in, uh, by measuring blood levels of hormones or by um, uh, obtaining a brain scan or some other, um, some other biological measure that has a one-to-one -one correspondence with any of these uh, subtypes, and that's um, really kind of useful in widespread clinical practice for diagnosing them or, again, for matching treatments to individual patients. So our, our approach in the study I'm about to describe was to kind of turn this upside down and ask whether instead of starting with clinical symptoms, could we start with neurobiological measures and ask whether we could cluster patients on the basis of kind of co-occurring patterns of um, neurobiological um, uh, differences. And, and then if we could, if we could subtype patients in this way, um, were those subtypes useful for predicting 
um, interesting um, or uh, clinically useful differences in the way their symptoms present and the way that they respond to treatment. And, uh, and, and that's basically kind of the, the, the rationale, the background for, for the, the approach to the study I'm about to describe. Um, but, but before I can jump into that, um, that, that approach begs this other kind of more basic question, which is um, what kinds of neurobiological signatures should we focus on? Um, and we've known for some time um, that if you, if you obtain an MRI brain scan like this one in the upper left, if you obtain an MRI brain scan from a patient with depression, um, the kind of brain scan someone might get if they had a head injury and they went to an emergency room um, to make sure that there was no bleeding in the brain. If you look at these brain scans, um, they're, they're, the, the brains of people with depression look basically normal. Um, there's, 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 not, there's nothing that stands out um, in the structure of someone's brain at this level um, that, that tells you that they're depressed. Um, but this, uh, th these kinds of images belie this tremendous complexity that lies just beneath the surface. So in each one of these pixels in this image, there are um, hundreds of thousands, probably millions of, uh, of brain cells. And these brain cells, neurons we call them, um, have these fine uh, branch-like extensions um, that enable them to communicate with other nerve cells. And if you zoom in even further, you can see that these, th these branches, kind of like branches on a tree, have these tiny um, microscopic protrusions that contain what we call synapses. Um, synapses are connections between brain cells. Um, and they play a vital role in, in enabling communication between brain cells. And a lot of research in recent years has focused on the role of, um, of, of, of synapses in depression and other kinds of mental illness. And although we can't measure synapses, um, visualize them, or, or even um, measure their function directly in the, in the human brain in a non-invasive way, um, we can use brain imaging to get kind of an indirect proxy for how synapses are functioning in the brain. Um, and if you'll just bear with me for a second, I'll tell you a little bit about that um, before I jump into telling you about our, our findings. So uh, the way this works, um, is based on a discovery by uh, two um, really pioneering scientists, um, Barat Biswal and Mark Rakel, um, about 15, 20 years ago now. Um, they showed that MRI brain scans can be sensitized um, to, to um, patterns of, uh, of um, blood oxygen consumption in the brain over time, and that the brain at rest exhibits these kinds of um, spontaneous fluctuations that you see in this video here. The, 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 the brain, um, the, the images that we're acquiring become brighter and dimmer over time um, as, the, as, as the activity level of the brain changes. And the critical discovery that, um, that Mark Rakel and Brock Biswell and others made was that regions of the brain that are strongly connected tend to fluctuate together. And that's what you see here. If we, if we segment the brain into a bunch of regions um, and then we extract these, um, these um, like a map of these um, fluctuations over time um, and we compare them, you can see that in uh, two brain regions that are highly connected, they, they go up and down together. And that kind of makes sense. If um, this red region is highly connected with this blue region, then when this red region becomes active, the blue region is also going to tend to become active. And that's why they tend to be um, highly correlated over time. And we can use these measures excuse me, there we go, we can use these measures uh, to um, create maps of how different brain regions are connected. And that's what you see here at the lower right. In this, in this image, um, warm colors denote brain regions that are, that are highly positively connected, and cool colors denote the opposite, brain regions where when one becomes active, the other becomes less active. And uh, it was these maps that we chose to focus on. Um, and in order to accomplish our goal, um, that is trying to discover new um, ways of subtyping patients with depression based on these maps, we knew we would leave, need lots of data. And that's where um, these people you see, if I can jump ahead to the next slide, there we go. These people you see pictured here, um, that's where they come in. So um, I, I like to highlight their contribution first um, because it's these folks who really made the work possible. 
Um, I went around the country basically begging everyone I knew um, who had data like this and a lot of people I didn't know um, who, who had collected data um, from patients with depression to uh, share their data with me. And the people you see pictured here are the people who are generous enough to do that or to contribute to the project in some other way. Um, uh, many of these folks shared their data with us before it was even um, published and, and otherwise available, and I'm tremendously grateful to them um, for, for making this work possible. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, most of the work I'm going to present to you um, is based on this first data set, um, which um, was, was collected from 711 subjects. Um, that's uh, 333 um, depressed patients. These are actively depressed patients, unipolar depression, um, who are collected from um, five different institutions, um, uh, that, that is universities across the country. Um, and we use this data set to discover the subtypes that I'm about to describe. And then importantly, we also had a second data set um, comprising 477 subjects, 215 patients with unipolar depression, um, the remainder of those subjects were um, healthy control subjects, and we used this second data set to, to replicate our results. Um, so um, without further ado, I'll jump into telling you um, what we found. So as I mentioned before, we began by taking the brain scans that we had, that, that were shared with us um, by, by investigators from various sites across the country and parcelating them like you see here and that basically just means dividing the brain into, into smaller regions, um, extracting um, the MRI um, brain, uh, what we call a bold signal from each of these regions and asking how each MRI um, bold signal from each of these regions, um, how it's correlated with every other region. In other words, um, how they are functionally connected. Um, for, for the rest of the talk, I'm, I'm going to use those terms um, interchangeably just for simplicity. Um, I'll talk about um, functional connectivity. Um, and by that, I, I don't mean actual um, structural connections in the brain for aficionados who, who may be listening. Um, rather, I mean how these different brain regions are correlated over time, which we think is a proxy for, for, for how brain regions are connected with one another. Um, now, what you see here are, um, is a map of how each region in the brain is connected with every other region. Um, and that gave us um, a tremendous amount of information. So there are something like 33,000 um, unique functional connectivity features in this map. And we were pretty confident that most of these would have nothing to do with depression. Um, um, the, the brain isn't um, globally changed necessarily by depression. Rather, most of what we know about, um, about depression studies from the last few decades suggest that particular areas of the brain are altered. And so um, we knew that in order to accomplish this goal of subtyping patients, we would need a way of selecting um, which of these um, connectivity features are uh, most important in depression um, and clustering patients um, on that basis. And that's what you see depicted here um, for, for aficionados or technical experts who may be listening. The, the method we used here is called um, canonical correlation analysis, and it's really um, actually simpler than it sounds. The idea is just that we look for different combinations of connectivity features that are correlated with predictive of different kinds of clinical symptoms. And what we found were at least um, two factors, or, or, or that we'll, we'll call it for lack of a better term, two factors. One um, you, you see depicted here, a set of brain regions, um, connectivity between these brain regions was predictive of the degree to which patients um, reported feeling anhedonic, anhedonia referring to a lack of, a loss of interest in formerly pleasurable or enjoyable activities. So connectivity in these brain regions was predictive of anhedonia in our patients and to a lesser extent of uh, uh, psychomotor slowing, feeling kind of um, lethargic, not able to get out of bed in the morning, um, and uh, guilty rumination. And then we had a second set of connectivity features, the distribution of which you see depicted here, and they were not predictive of anhedonia or psychomotor slowing. Rather, they were more, more strongly predictive of anxiety and, and insomnia. And uh, using those um, these kind of connectivity factors, um, we then clustered patients. Um, and what you see here are um, our initial results of that clustering. Um, so uh, 
this this is a dendrogram, and the the main take home message um, here again it's simpler than it looks. It's just that there are at least four groups of patients in this dendrogram. The linkages these um, these these lines kind of like in a family tree that connect branches of the tree. The height of the linkages are, is proportional to how different are the things being clustered. And what you can kind of appreciate is that the links between clusters are much higher than the average link between a patient with uh, between two patients within a cluster. In other words, these clusters are are defining groups, subgroups of patients with depression who have um, relatively similar patterns of of abnormal connectivity in the brain, um, similar within a cluster, but different between clusters. And that's kind of the important message here. Um, and before I, I proceed and tell you a little bit more about what, what I think will be most interesting to, to patients and family members, um, I want to emphasize that we don't think that this is um, the, the final or even the best um, solution to this problem of subtyping in depression. Um, we, we think that the, the subtypes that we discovered were driven in part by the data that we had available to us. But what I want to try to convince you of is that this is just one solution and that this solution is, is potentially useful for rethinking the way we go about diagnosing patients with depression and ultimately for, for mapping treatments to those individual patients. Um, so let me let me give you a couple of examples of that. Um, so um, again, uh, this is kind of a complicated slide, but the take-home message is, is is simpler than it looks. What this shows you is a map of um, of what's abnormal in the brains of people with depression um, in terms of how different brain regions are connected. Here, cool colors like you see here um, depict um, brain regions whose connectivity is reduced in depression, and warm colors depict brain regions whose connectivity is increased in depression. And this map depicts um, connections um, that were abnormal, that were altered in all of our patients with depression. Um, they were shared across all the four subtypes. And what we found was that the degree to which connectivity in these circuits, these networks, um, the degree to which connectivity was altered was predictive of these symptoms that pretty much all depressed patients had. And they included uh, depressed mood, anhedonia, and low energy and fatigue. In our data sets, um, about 97% of all of our patients had at least mild levels of these symptoms. And um, patients with more altered connectivity had more severe depressed mood, anhedonia, and low energy. Um, so, so what we think this tells us is that there are certain connectivity features that, um, that all subtypes, all four subtypes share, and they're predictive of symptoms that most patients with depression have. Um, but at the same time, there are other connectivity features that are unique to the subtypes, and that's what you see here. Um, there are four maps. Again, cool colors means reduced in depression. Um, warm colors mean um, increased strength in depression. Um, and what you can see just by glancing at these four maps corresponding to the four subtypes, um, you can see just by glancing at them that they're very different. That uh, DSM assigns a single diagnostic label, major depressive disorder, to at least four groups of people with very different patterns of altered connectivity in the brain. And interestingly, these altered um, connectivity patterns were also predictive in kind of intuitively appealing ways, and we need to we need so, so we need to test this going forward. But they were predictive in intuitively appealing ways of uh, differences in clinical symptoms. Um, so here's a few examples: um, patients with uh, subtypes three and four had elevated levels of anhedonia, that is, a, a loss of interest in in previously um, enjoyable activities. Um, compared to sub patients in subtypes 1 and 2, um, whereas patients in subtypes uh, 1 and 4 had elevated levels of anxiety compared to 2 and 3. There were also differences in insomnia, um, energy levels, and uh, psychomotor retardation or psychomotor slowing. Um, and um, that was that was uh, quite interesting to us um, as well for reasons that I will touch on again in a moment. Um, uh, before proceeding to tell you a little bit about um, how we think we can use these this approach to subtyping to um, to improve the way we the way we map treatments to individual patients I want to tell you a little bit about how we think this approach might be useful for developing new biomarkers so biomarkers 
um, um, biomarkers are just um, biological measures that we can use to help diagnose an illness um, or, or to help uh, guide treatments um, for that illness. And in many areas of medicine, biomarkers have kind of transformed the way doctors um, think about, um, ab about helping their patients um, by mapping individual treatments to the, to the pa individual patients who are most likely to benefit from them. But in psychiatry, biomarker has been, develop has been difficult, biomarker development has been difficult for all the reasons I just described, um, um, particularly related to the challenges of, um, of, of, of uh, a weak correspondence between our diagnostic labels and, uh, and the underlying biology of the illness. So what we wanted to do was test whether we could use this approach to subtyping to, uh, to develop brain scan based biomarkers for diagnosing these subtypes. And again, uh, this is a complicated slide, but, what you, but the message is, is relatively simple. What you can see is that um, we optimize different steps um, for diagnosing these subtypes um, based on the, on the brain scans. And uh, at the beginning, our, our, the performance of our biomarkers um, was poor. It was barely better than chance in differentiating healthy control subjects and, and patients. But with a lot of optimization, we could improve the performance of those, of those uh, biomarkers to, to a little short of 90%. So we think that um, that's, you know, maybe not quite what we might want for, um, for use in a clinic, um, but, it's, but it's getting close. Um, this gives you a little um, clearer sense of, of how well these biomarkers performed in, in the individual subtypes. Again, you can see in the range of 84 to 91 percent um, correct, correct um, diagnoses for differentiating um, depressed patients and healthy controls. Um, and uh, next, we wanted to ask uh, a related question. Um, having developed these, these biomarkers, um, these um, basically statistical classifiers for, for diagnosing the subtypes in individual patients, we wanted to ask whether they were stable over time. And that, that I think, um, is a really important question because um, it provided kind of a sanity check for us that what we, were, what we were doing made sense. We wanted to make sure that we weren't clustering subjects on, on um, the basis of something that didn't really mean anything for depression. Like, for example, you might imagine that um, if a, if a patient who, who participated in our study um, had a fight with his wife, an argument with his wife before he came into the scanner, um, or um, if that patient didn't sleep well last night, or even depending on what the patient was thinking about when the patient was um, sitting in the scanner, all of these factors might influence the, 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 brain, the brain scan that we obtained from that patient, um, the, it might influence the, 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 the measure of connectivity that we were obtaining using those brain scans um, in a way that has nothing to do with depression. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't subtyping people um, on the basis of something that had nothing to do with depression. Um, and to do that, we, we asked a really simple question, and that's whether if a patient gets diagnosed with subtype 1 today, and we rescan them five weeks later and they're still depressed, um, will they still get diagnosed with subtype 1 at that second time point? Um, if these uh, subtypes are kind of clinically, biologically meaningful subtypes, then you'd predict that they would. Um, and that's indeed what we found. Most people who are diagnosed with subtype 1 at scan 1 had the same subtype diagnosis in the second scan um, four to five weeks later. Um, and, um, and so on for subtypes 2, 3, and 4. So the fact that these subtypes were stable over time was really helpful in telling us um, that, that perhaps we were onto something in terms of these subtypes being, being clinically meaningful. Um, and then lastly, I told you a little bit about that second data set um, that we used for replication purposes, and this is also really important. Um, again, if there's any aficionados um, of these methods listening to this talk, um, they will know that these methods, um, what, what we call machine learning methods, um, are kind of notorious for overfitting to idiosyncrasies in, uh, in the data that they're trained on. In other words, um, the, the biomarkers might work really well in, in the data set that we, that we train them on, but then when you test them on a new data set from new subjects um, who were scanned in different cities um, on different brain scanners, they might not perform well at all. So we wanted to make sure they replicated well, and indeed we found that they did, um, that we could, we could 
correctly diagnose individual patients with depression and differentiate them from healthy control subjects um, with accuracy rates in the range of 80 to um, you know 92 um, uh, percent, roughly similar to what we found in in the training sample. So again, that was kind of um, reassuring to us that we were that we were on to something, um, and and that this was that this was likely to be meaningful. Um, okay, in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to shift gears and I'm going to tell you um, about. Uh, Two, two last kind of um, quite interesting sets of findings. Um, one of them has to do with how these subtypes um, uh, cross uh, conventional diagnostic boundaries. So what I've shown you so far tells us that um, DSM, our, our current diagnostic system, assigns a signal label, major depressive disorder, to people with at least four very different patterns of altered connectivity as measured by these brain scans. What we wanted to ask next was kind of the converse, and that's whether DSM assigns different labels to patients who have uh, related um, diagnoses um, in terms of their brain scans. And the diagnosis that we focused on for this purpose was uh, generalized anxiety disorder. Um, and we did that for a number of reasons. We know that uh, generalized anxiety disorder and depression tend to run in families together. We think that the genetics um, that, that contribute to risk for depression are probably related to the, to the genetic risk factors for, for anxiety. We know that many kids who are anxious grow up to be depressed. We know that many adults who are depressed also have symptoms of anxiety. So there was a lot of reason to think that these two diagnoses were related. So we just asked uh, a couple of simple questions about how our classifiers, our, our biomarkers, um, uh, treated patients with generalized anxiety disorder who did not have a diagnosis of depression. And what we found here, um, again, this is a map of what's altered in the brains of people with generalized anxiety disorder. Warm colors mean increased in anxiety compared to healthy controls. Cool colors mean decreased. Um, and what you can see um, in this little like Venn diagram is that uh, although the connectivity features that define depression are different from the connectivity features that define anxiety, um, there are there's substantial overlap. About about 22 percent of the connectivity features that define generalized anxiety disorder are also altered in depression. And when we asked how our biomarkers for the four depression subtypes treated people with generalized anxiety, what we found was quite interesting. We found that, uh, that a majority of people who had a diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder tested positive for one of our subtypes. Uh, so about 31% were classified as not depressed, but the remaining tested positive for one of our subtypes, and the vast majority of those tested positive for subtypes 1 in blue or subtype 4 in black. And you'll recall from the data I showed you a few minutes ago that the, that the two subtypes um, in our depression data set that had elevated levels of anxiety were subtypes 1 and subtypes 4, the same subtypes that many of these um, anxiety disorder patients are being diagnosed with. Um, furthermore, when we look at other symptoms, an interesting pattern emerges, and that's that uh, their, their anxiety symptoms in these generalized anxiety disorder patients, they do not vary by subtype, and that kind of makes sense. Um, all of these patients are anxious. They have high levels of, of um, anxiety um, as, as indexed by this, um, this self-report, um, but their depressive symptoms did vary by subtype. That is, Patients who uh, were diagnosed with one of our subtypes had significantly elevated depressive symptoms compared to the healthy control, the, or, sorry, the patients who had anxiety but were, cal were diagnosed as not depressed. And furthermore, um, the patients who were diagnosed as subtypes 3 or 4 had elevated levels of anhedonia compared to subtype uh, 1, um, which was in turn increased compared to people who were diagnosed as not depressed at all. Um, so what we think this shows is that uh, these subtypes that we've identified um, based on connectivity measures in the brain um, cross conventional diagnostic boundaries in interesting and intuitive ways, um, and there's some consistency in how their symptoms, um, their depressive symptoms, their anhedonia symptoms, how they relate to their brain scan diagnoses. But there was one thing that was bothering us a little, and that's whether um, 
perhaps the the uh, connectivity measures that we were that we were detecting with these biomarkers um, were kind of non-specific for any kind of generalized form of psychopathology. Um, in other words, um, does anyone with any kind of mental illness um, tend to test positive uh, for one of our subtypes? And what we found uh, by looking at patients with schizophrenia was that that was not the case. So in this sample of about 75 patients with schizophrenia but not depression, um, almost all of those patients tested negative. In other words, these uh, these diagnostic biomarkers for um, for subtypes of depression uh, they cross diagnostic boundaries, conventional diagnostic boundaries, in interesting and intuitive ways, but they still retain some some level of specificity, which is important if we're if we're ever going to be able to use a, an approach like this for uh, thinking about how we go about treat, treating patients. And of course, um, that's that's what matters most. Uh, lastly, in just the last few minutes before we kind of take a break for questions, um, I want to tell you a little bit about what's maybe most exciting, and that's um, how we think we can use this approach to to improve the way we go about treating patients. Um, the the treatment that we focused on here is called uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation (TMS). Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, TMS um, is an established FDA-approved treatment for depression. Um, it's non-invasive, um, but it's a brain stimulation technique. And the way it works is by applying a, a, a magnetic field, a rapidly fluctuating magnetic field, to the brain through the scalp. So it's totally non-invasive. A person just comes into a psychiatrist's office, and it, and it can be administered right there in the office, and the patient goes home um, right after the session. Um, and we've known for many years that uh, when you apply this treatment to TMS um, to the brain repeatedly over a period of several weeks, that patients with uh, even treatment-resistant depression who have not responded well to other antidepressants, they tend to get better over time. And importantly, we've also known from our, our own work and from other folks' work as well that um, brain measures of, uh, of connectivity, like the ones I was showing you before, are sensitive to TMS, so TMS alters them. What you see here is kind of um, pre-TMS and post-TMS, um, and the connectivity features that are altered in depression get normalized after TMS um, uh, in, in patients who are undergoing treatment. Um, and furthermore, the, the degree to which a person has abnormal connectivity or altered connectivity in some of these networks um, before they get TMS is predictive of their likelihood of going on to respond to TMS. And that's important because it tells us that there's maybe some potential for using these brain scans for, uh, for informing which patients are most likely to benefit from that treatment. And that's, that's, that's really critical because um, we also know that this treatment, um, while it is effective, it doesn't work for everyone. And like many other antidepressants, it takes four to five weeks to have any effect. And of course, that's really frustrating for, for, for patients and their families and for doctors as well um, when, they, when they try this treatment um, only to learn five weeks later that it's really not working and they need to kind of start from scratch and try something else. So what we wanted to test was whether we could use our approach to subtyping um, patients with depression to inform um, these kinds of decisions about who would be most likely to benefit from TMS and, and who wouldn't. And what you see here are the initial results of that of that experiment, that test. What we found um, was, uh, so we, we obtained brain scans. Um, this is in collaboration, by the way, with, um, with my colleague Jonathan Downer at the University of Toronto. Um, we obtained brain scans from patients with depression. Um, we subtyped them. And then um, these patients received uh, TMS targeting um, a brain region uh, called the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex. Um, it basically lies um, uh, along the midline of your head, um, um, kind of um, uh, at, the, at the front of the, of the head. And um, this, uh, this brain region we know is responsive to TMS and can be, and can be used um, for treating patients with depression. And what we found was that patients who were diagnosed with subtypes 1 or subtype 3 were much more likely to respond to TMS than patients who are diagnosed with subtype 2 or subtype 4. Here you see another way of depicting that same data. The, the degree to which a person improved was much larger in subtype 1 
um, and to a lesser extent in subtype 3 than it was in subtypes 2 or 4. Um, these people in subtype 1 in particular showed really strong response rates uh, to, to this kind of TMS. Um, and what you see here um, is kind of a, a second step towards what we think of um, as uh, potentially um, preci precision medicine in psychiatry. Um, here we asked whether we could um, whether we could design a, a, a prognostic biomarker, um, a, a statistical classifier that could be used for predicting who would respond to TMS and who wouldn't based on different kinds of measures that we could obtain from those people prior to treatment. What you see here are the results for predicting responders R and non-responders NR um, based just on brain connectivity measures as indexed by that fMRI brain scan I described earlier. And what you can see is that we can do okay, um, about 78, 79% um, correct prediction rates, uh, but that's still not as well as we'd like. Um, to, to actually start using this in clinical practice. But you can see by adding in the subtype diagnosis, we can improve the performance of those biomarkers significantly to something in the range of 87 to 94 um, percent correct predictions. Um, and uh, the last thing we wanted to test was whether we could just use clinical symptoms to do just as well, because you'll recall I told you before that, um, that our four subtypes had a different patterns of, of clinical symptoms. And what we found um, was that although clinical symptoms like the degree to which someone was anhedonic or anxious or not sleeping, they were predictive to some degree of whether someone would go on to respond to TMS or not. Um, they weren't um, nearly as predictive um, as a combination of these uh, connectivity features and their subtype diagnosis. So we think this is promising. Um, I, I, I want to emphasize, I always emphasize this um, when I'm giving this uh, talk to patients and families that I think um, we're really excited about this work, but it's still early days. Um, it, it's really critical that we, that we validate this, that we replicate these findings, and that other groups replicate them as well, and test um, to what extent uh, these, these methods can really be used for predicting individual treatment response rates um, in individual patients and, and guiding treatment decisions um, on a more widespread basis, um, not just kind of in the, uh, the relatively um, unique um, situation of a patient participating in a research study at an academic institution. Um, so we don't think that these are ready for widespread clinical use yet. Um, that, that's still some ways away. But we think what this data tells us is that this approach holds a lot of promise, um, and we're, we're, we're pretty confident that, that we can improve upon it further and that other investigators will probably figure out um, other ways of, of doing this um, even more effectively. Um, and with that, before we stop to take some questions, I just want to highlight some of the folks who, who were responsible for carrying out this work, um, in particular Andrew Drysdale, a very talented MD-PhD student who is now a psychiatry resident at Washington University. Um, and the folks highlighted in red here, Mark Dubin, Faith Gunning, George Alexopoulos, Jonathan Downer, BJ Casey, Mike Fox, Alvaro Pasqualione, um, Helen Mayberg, Amit Etkin, and Alan Schatzberg, who were generous enough to share their data with us and make this work possible. And of course, um, none of this would have happened without generous support from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation and our, and our other sources of financial support. Um, these are all uh, academic institutions. Um, I, uh, I, I should have um, mentioned I, I don't have any conflicts of interest or any other um, financial stakes um, uh, in this work. Um, so I think with that, I'll pause. Um, do we have some time, Jeff, for uh, questions? Yes, we, we do. Uh, first of all, kind of thank you so much, first of all, for the work that you've been doing on this um, and for, for really explaining some very complicated uh, issues in a way that uh, the general public, the lay public can, can understand. Uh, so I, I think this is very exciting. And as you said, it's not quite ready for prime time for individual patients but has the potential to, to get to that point. And um, one of the questions that a number of people ask is, what will it take to get to the point that it can be used for um, actual patients in clinical care? 
Yeah, um, I, I think that that's that's a really critical question. Um, it's one we think about here in my lab every day. Um, uh, I could I could talk about that uh, ad nauseum, and I won't. But I'll tell you just two points that I think are really important um, uh, questions we need to answer before we bring this um, into widespread clinical use. First of all. Um, this work needs to be replicated. Um, we, we, I'd like to see um, other groups um, using similar methods and testing whether it works um, in other people's hands um, at other academic institutions and also outside of academic institutions because oftentimes the kinds of patients that participate in research studies um, may not necessarily be representative of the kinds of patients that we see in the broader world. Um, and sometimes that happens in ways that are hard to predict. We try to control for that, of course, um, but it's really critical um, before we start using these, um, uh, these these kind of methods all over the place that we know how well they work um, and that we know um, under what circumstances um, they don't work so well, um, what are the limits um, of, 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 of how they work and how they don't work. Um, so, so replication. Um, uh, and and testing by other labs, I think, is a is a really critical step. Um, a second step that I think will be really important uh, is testing whether a similar approach can be used for predicting response to treatments that are that are in more widespread clinical use today. So we focused on TMS. Um, the brain region, I didn't mention this, the brain region that we were targeting is the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, um, which is actually not the FDA approved um, site. It is one that we know works um, from, from multiple published studies. Um, and we focus on that one for a number of reasons that I won't get into here. Um, but uh, we really need to test whether a similar approach um, also works for the FDA approved dorsolateral prefrontal sites. And maybe even more importantly, whether this approach can be used to predict response to um, medications, um, first line therapies for depression like fluoxetine, uh, acetalopram, uh, sertraline, um, medications that probably a lot of our listeners today are, are more familiar with um, than, than TMS. That will also be really important. All right. So really the goal is to be able to use this technique to then help the physician uh, decide with the patient what medicine or other treatment is most likely to help them. Talk therapy could be one of those options as well in terms of, of, of treatment for people. That's exactly right. And um, I'd like to actually, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I'd like to highlight um, a recent study from um, one of our collaborators, um, also a brain and behavior research um, foundation um, scientist, um, Helen Mayberg. She's done amazing work showing that we can use this kind of brain scan approach to predict who's most likely to respond to a drug versus who's most likely to respond to psychotherapy. This question of differential treatment response prediction, I think that's really critical, and that's something we'd like to test um, maybe in collaboration with Helen at some point in the future as well. Yeah, very useful and important, as you pointed out, given the time it takes for medicine or other treatments to work. If you have a better chance of it actually working first time around, it makes a big difference in people's that's lives. Right. That's right. One, one question that uh, a person asked um, relates to bipolar disorder. You spoke about general anxiety. You spoke about comparing it also to people with schizophrenia. Um, any information about bipolar disorder, um, depression and bipolar disorder, and, and what you're seeing uh, with these types of studies? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, another one that we think about a lot in the lab. I think it really gets to the root of a problem, which is that, um, you know, for the most part, we don't need brain scans to diagnose depression. You can see it in a friend or family member um, without any special training um, a lot of the time. But one diagnostic question that can be really hard and that has really important clinical implications is distinguishing between unipolar depression and bipolar depression. For listeners who aren't aware of the difference, bipolar depression um, refers to a kind of depression that, that um, happens in some patients who also experience periods of of um, remarkably elevated mood 
um, and, uh, and, and these patients tend to respond differently to medications. Some of the medications that are useful for unipolar depression can actually be harmful for bipolar depression. So we'd love it if uh, this approach to subtyping patients could, could differentiate between bipolar and unipolar. Unfortunately, we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, all of the patients in our study that I just described had unipolar depression. That's an important limitation. We are working to test whether a similar approach could be useful for differentiating bipolar patients, but that's going to mean um, analyzing a different kind of data set, um, one, that, one that we haven't um, fully analyzed yet. So I don't know the answer to that, but hopefully if you check back in a year or so, maybe we'll have more information on that. Well, we, we may need to bring you back to, to give the next webinar on that because obviously it's very important. Another important issue in depression and, and other psychiatric conditions um, is the issue of suicide risk. And I'm curious, is there anything in your data and your analysis that, have, that can be helpful in terms of potential biomarkers for people who might be at greater risk of attempting suicide? Yeah, that's a that's a really important question too. Um, you know, suicide obviously is um, probably um, the uh, uh, gravest outcome that we face as psychiatrists and mental health care providers in treating our patients. Um, it's one with really huge public health implications. Um, and a, a challenge in studying suicide is that it's, it's um, thankfully um, it's a relatively rare event. Um, and so um, we don't uh, know as much about, um, like most of the patients in our study, for example, um, uh, don't have a history of suicide attempts. Um, and certainly there were there were no completed suicides um, or, or 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 suicide attempts um, in during the duration of our study in any of the subjects that were involved. Um, what we do know um, is that. Some of the questionnaires that are administered, the clinician rating scales and the self-reports ask patients and their doctors about, uh, about suicidal thinking, which is not the same as suicide attempts. Um, uh, and we, it does look like provisionally um, that one of these subtypes is associated with an increased uh, risk of suicidal thinking. Um, but uh, we we really need more data to say anything conclusive about um, how um, this measure of, of risk for suicidal thinking relates to people's risk for actual suicide attempts, which is, of course, um, what we care about more. Um, and we think that the way to tackle this is by is by collaborating with investigators who have um, much larger scale data sets um, and and information to, to you know, speak to that question directly and we hope to we hope to be able to address that soon obviously a very important issue you, you spoke about um, the, the general anxiety group and, and, the, and you, you mentioned the important point that often people at a younger age with anxiety may be at higher risk of developing and uh, depression um, are there, do you have any information on looking at people who have not yet um, developed a depression but that may uh, be at higher risk of developing depression and therefore there may be uh, methods of depression, of, of prevention um, that can be done before depression really uh, takes hold? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, again, another one that we're really interested in. Um, uh, it kind of it raises a, a related issue, um, which is you know whether these subtypes, which we're diagnosing on the basis of altered connectivity um, in a brain scan, um, whether uh, that altered connectivity is something that uh, precedes the onset of symptoms. Um, maybe it's there before a person ever gets depressed. Maybe it's kind of a stable feature of that person's brain that renders them kind of at risk of, de of becoming depressed. Um, on the other hand, it might be the case that, uh, that these altered connectivity features are kind of um, a, a state-dependent um, uh, feature of the person's brain that varies with their mood state. So it's kind of indicative of the fact that the person is currently depressed, but if you rescan them again, um, a, a few months later when they were no longer depressed, you wouldn't see these changes. Um, although we don't have data to address the question of, um, of 
uh, risk um, for developing depression in patients who've never been depressed before. Um, we do know um, that uh, if we look at patients repeatedly over time, it's probably the case that what we're measuring here is a combination of those two things. It's some of those altered connectivity features are stable features of the person's brain, and some of them uh, vary with the person's mood state. Um, the fact that some are stable features of the person's brain um, suggests to me that they might proceed the onset of symptoms, they might be kind of a sign of risk for, for developing depression, in which case, you know, like if we scanned adolescents or people in young adults who are at high risk for becoming depressed, um, they might be predictive of, of, um, of depressive outcomes. And, you know, that itself could be really powerful because there are lots of interventions you might imagine deploying that don't involve medications or, or TMS or brain stimulation. Um, um, easier um, uh, interventions like, um, you know, stress reduction um, and uh, just knowing who's at risk um, and uh, being able to warn those people to avoid other risk factors for depression, that could be really powerful. We're working with collaborators who, who have data that might help us address that, um, but again, we just don't know the answers to those questions yet. Great. Well, there's a... While well, well, you've developed a lot of very important information, in some ways the, all of these new developments bring up new questions that, that need to be looked at as well. Um, so it, it's, it's a very exciting time. Um, as a last question, I want to ask you, what, what do you see down the road? What, what do you envision in three years, five years, ten years um, down the road in terms of how this is going to affect clinical care and people's lives. Yeah, you know, that's a that that that's something I think about all the time too. I think um in the in the near term, um what I'm most excited about um is using this approach. Um and again, I don't think that it's going to be just my lab um doing this. I think there are uh, labs um all over the country who are using similar methods to tackle related problems. Um, using this approach to to guide uh, the selection of existing treatments, um, I think, is really powerful. Um, I think what I'm most excited about in the in kind of the near term is an approach similar to what um, to what Helen Mayberg has done, which is um, you know differential treatment response prediction. Um, that is, um, can I tell someone not just that this treatment is or is not going to work for you, but rather um, I can tell them. Treatment A is not going to work for you, but treatment B is going to work for you. Um, and uh, that would be really powerful, um, and I think it could do a lot to kind of bend the, the, the curve um, on those statistics that I described at the beginning of the talk today about the kind of accumulating burden of mental illness over time that's, that's due in part to the kind of frustrating um, trial and error approach to treatment that we're often forced to use. And then the longer term, I think what's equally and maybe even more exciting is the potential for using this approach to um, think about developing fundamentally new treatments. Um, many of the treatments we, we use today um, are really uh, closely related to one another, um, and it's been frustrating for many scientists and doctors and patients um, that we haven't seen fundamentally new treatments for depression in some time now. Um, there are some... Um, promising candidates on the horizon, but I think that uh, that rethinking um, how we diagnose mental illness and depression in particular, and identifying uh, kind of more homogeneous subtypes um, might make it easier to to understand the biology of depression. And and if we understand biology, then hopefully we can develop kind of fundamentally new drugs and other interventions that aren't just kind of cousins of the drugs that we have today. Um, well, Kana, I think that is a, a vision we all would love to see. And I want to, again, thank you um, for the work that you're doing and um, for joining us today to share um, this, this exciting, exciting work uh, um, that you're doing in your lab. Uh, I want to also thank everybody who's joined us. Um, all of the research that we fund is made possible through private donations so please consider making a contribution by, by visiting our website, vbrfoundation.org, or call 1-800-829-8289.
This webinar has been recorded, so if you've missed any portion or would like to share it with a family member or friend, please visit the events and webinar page on our website. And I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Holly Schwartz, professor of psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh, will present Psychosocial Interventions for Maternal Depression, Impact on School-Aged Children. This will take place on Tuesday, October 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of the day. Take care.